Whether you just went to Lollapalooza or maybe you're planning on going to Target for Black Friday, the fact of the matter is we're all surrounded by crowds and navigating those crowds can be difficult. Hey, I'm Kyle, this is Crossroads Church. We believe that you were born for adventure and we exist to guide and equip you on the adventurous life that God made you for. And over the last 18 months, some of us have been terrified of crowds. Others of us have been so excited to finally be around a crowd again. And regardless of whether, where, where you fall on that spectrum, my friend Allie has a word today about how to navigate the crowd. If you're anything like me, then you probably always have some relationships in your life that are going great and maybe others that aren't so great. Today, I want to help you love every single person that you know in your life right now and do it better. Maybe if we do a really good job together today, then we'll both be a little bit closer to loving people like Ted Lasso does. Am I the only one that's watching that show? It is so good. The guy loves people really well. We're gonna try to love a little bit more like him today. My name is Allie and I am one of the teaching pastors here at Crossroads. And my job is to help you by taking the truths that we find in the Bible and helping you put those to work in your life every single day. Last week, Brian talked about kind of the baseline call on all of our lives to love others. And he kind of talked about what love actually is. But the reality that we're gonna to confront together today is that we don't have the capacity in ourselves to love everyone in our life in the same exact way. I'm gonna give you a framework today, a framework of four realms of relationship that I see in the life of Jesus when I read through the Bible. Those four realms are His core, His circle, His community, and His crowd. And as you're listening, I actually want you to get out a notebook. I actually brought mine, good old fashioned piece of paper and a pen. I want you to get out a notebook and I want you to take notes on the names of people in your very own life as we go through all of these realms together today, because I bet that you will have an insight that brings you great freedom in some of your relationships today. So draw four circles. You're gonna label them core, circle, community and crowd, and I want you to write people's names down as we go. Because problems in our life and in our relationships, they happen when we treat people in our life like they're in one realm and they're actually in another. So we're gonna think about every single person that's in our life and put them somewhere on that piece of paper today. Everyone around Jesus thrived. Everyone around Jesus got loved but everyone did not get the same things from him. A few years back, I felt overwhelmed with the number of relationships in my life. I always felt this sense like I didn't quite have enough to go around. Like there wasn't enough of me to love my spouse and my four kids and all the wonderful friends that I have and all the coworkers I really like and all the parents I know from my kids' schools and other groups that I, that I touch through my everyday life. And, I literally started writing names on a piece of paper and talking to God about who was in my life and how I figure out who should be close, who can be further away. How do I do this, God? How do I love all of these people that I know? And this little exercise actually brought me into the Gospels, which are the accounts of Jesus's life. And I didn't just read his words. I wanted to watch how he organized his relationships. And that's when I saw the four realms that we are gonna talk about today. But it's kind of crazy, right? Like if Jesus was God, why couldn't he just treat everybody like his best friend? Why couldn't he just have all the besties? But he didn't. He actually had smaller realms of relationship. He gave some people more access, more time, and he had more impact on some of their lives. And it's because he was also fully human. Not just God, also human which means in his human body, he kind of accepted limitations that you and I know instinctively are there. We have limits on our energy. We have limits on our time. We have limits on our capacity that is actually different by person for relationships in our life. So first, we're gonna start with the core. And the reason I started here is because in my life, these are the most obvious names. Maybe for you, you're gonna need to leave this blank and you're gonna have to think about this as you go. And that's totally okay. 
but any name that you write in the core has got to be worthy of the core. This is your inner circle. These are your full access people, the very few, maybe one, maybe two. I'm gonna say three at the most. We've got names for these folks. I love these names. Some people I know call them their ride or dies. My daughter calls them her BFF. And my friend says it's the where the body is buried kind of people in your life. This is like Meredith Gray and Christina Yang or Chandler and Joey or Dwayne The Rock and Kevin Hart, whoever, you know what I mean. You love your core really well when you show them unconditional love, a special kind of godly love that is unconditional. And these people are the ones that you don't have to measure your words with. You don't tell the half truths. You don't leave out the bad parts of stories because you know when you come to the end and they know all the stuff, they're not going anywhere. They're gonna keep on loving you no matter what. So for Jesus, these names were Peter, James, and John. He had three. So if you're writing yours down, if I was Jesus, let's just pretend for a second. I would write Peter, James, and John right there in my core. If you know who yours are as we talk, I want you to write them in. Jesus knew these guys so well. He gave them extra time, extra power, extra resources that other people didn't get. And most importantly, he actually let them see a part of who he was that no one else got to see. We get this interaction in the book of Matthew chapter 17, It says, after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, and he led them up a high mountain by themselves. And there he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as the light. He also took these same three guys after he showed them these parts of himself and his life that others didn't have access to. He actually took these guys on the night that he knew he was gonna be arrested, that he was about to face his death. And he asked them to pray for them, to pray for him as he stood in this garden. And guess what they did? They fell asleep. And one of them went on to actually deny he even knew Jesus three times that night. But Jesus kept loving them. He kept forgiving them. He kept treating them like his core. That's what we do for our core. We love them unconditionally. Because of the access that these people have to your life and probably the dirt they have on you, you need to pick them very, very carefully. The people that you put in this place should be rock solid. You need to have observed them over and over and over again. Because only mutual, unconditional commitment is ever going to feel right in this space. And that brings me to you married people, people like me who have a spouse. Your spouse should absolutely be in your core. Some people I know actually are amazing friends, but their spouse gets sort of the short end of the stick. If you have a spouse, you need to write their name down in your core right now and build into that relationship unconditionally. Now, in every one of these realms, I've observed some things as I've thought about relationships this way for several years now. And I'm gonna tell you a few things that I see that are common, and I hope you'll let me coach you a little bit because there are some things that I want you to start or stop in some of these realms. And for your core, I want you to stop letting these close friendships go undefined. I don't want you to make the mistake of leaving everybody in this big kind of general friend category. Because if you do that, you're gonna miss out on the best stuff, on all the real good stuff of core friendship. And I, honestly, I think men, you may need to hear this extra loud today because in our culture, it tends to be harder for men to define their very closest friendships and to, to commit to them and to really love each other like that. I've tried to coach my teenage son on this a little bit. And like every 16 year old boy, he loves talking about relationships with his mom. So I kind of question him and I'll say like, well, you know, on the team, you know, who do you feel kind of extra connected to trying to tease out this idea of like people that are extra close. And he's like, yeah, we're cool. I'm cool with all of them. Now I know that he feels differently about some of them. We all tend to know, but it can be scary and vulnerable 
to say it out loud, to kind of admit it, and maybe even to tell that other person. But when you do, you can unlock serious power, serious love, serious commitment in these core relationships by just saying the simple words, you know what? You're actually kind of one of my few. When we define, it often gives permission for that new level of commitment where we can love and be loved in a better way. These core relationships have the power to change how you feel about yourself and to actually set you up to love everybody in your life better. The next realm, one rung out from the core, this next one is our circle, our circle. It's not our inner couple, but it's our good friends. These are your people. These are the friends that you kind of walk through day-to-day -day life with. And you can love your circle well when you treat them like family. I think family love is a love that sees you, that knows you, that really understands you in a way that other people might not. Your circle should be people that might just brag about you behind your back. Jesus had 12 total, his three plus nine more. So maybe for you, do you have four, six, maybe 10 more? If you have a list of 20, I'm telling you, that's too many. You're more limited than you think you are. And when you're thinking about these names, I want you to go beyond fondness. Like it's not enough just to like someone because your circle is not supposed to be the nicest people that you know. C.S. Lewis um, says this about friends. He, he kind of talks about, I, re I read a book recently by him where he talks about a lot about friendship kind of love. And he says that friends walk shoulder to shoulder through life. He says, it is when we are doing things together that friendship springs up, painting, sailing ships, praying, philosophizing, and fighting shoulder to shoulder. Friends look in the same direction. Your circle should be oriented, focused, looking in the same direction somehow in, in your life. I have a friend that I like so much. I like her so much. I met her years ago. I'm telling you, she's just wonderful. And yet we have nothing that we can pursue shoulder to shoulder. We don't work together. We don't live near each other. We don't pursue common passions or interests. We don't, we don't mom together. We're not neighbors. And it kind of kills me because I really like her, but she's not in my 12. She can't be because we're not shoulder to shoulder on stuff. And when I write names on my piece of paper and I talk to God about who's in my life, I kind of realized that liking someone is not enough not to make it into your circle because you can't help each other become more. Your circle is there to help you become all of who God made you to be, literally to round you out it's like when you're with them, there's this constant invitation to become more of who you actually are. And when they're gone, something's missing, like you're operating at a deficit of some sort. I have one friend who for 20 years has pushed me toward risk and adventure. I have another who is like the best wife I know. She's just amazing at knowing how to love and support her husband. And you all, I need these people in my life. I need them to help me be all of who God has called me to be. A good circle is committed to way more than what you want. A good circle is to, committed to what God wants for you. But this is uh, honestly, I just confess, this is the hardest realm for me to manage in my own life for several reasons. The first is um, I don't, I tend to build a fence way out here. I tend to push people away. Like I'm good up close and I'm good in community, you know, and beyond, but I tend to build a fence right around my circle. And if anybody starts to push toward it, I'm like, I don't like you that much, go away. I just kind of get a little prickly out there. And I assume you kind of won't stick around, so I make it a little bit hard. And my longest time friend, um, she and I laugh now because it's been, I don't know, more than 20 years now. And she still laughs at me because I tried to get rid of her. Like at least twice I tried to shake her off the first couple years that we knew each other. But my circle stuck because guess who sent them? God sent them to me. And one way I recognize mine is that they bring with them the grace to jump over my fence. They just keep saying, I'm not going anywhere, Allie. 
The second reason though, honestly, it's hard for me to manage this realm of relationship in my life is that I have kids. Parents, when you're thinking about your relational world and organizing your relationships, your kids need to be generally accounted for in your circle. No, it's not the same as a friend, but it is a similar kind of investment as your circle. And my greatest hope, honestly, as a mom is that all of my kids will end up as legit friends of mine. Like in our mature relationship, we will actually be friends. But right now I have to account for loving them and loving them well with all the time and energy of a circle. And for me in this season of my life, that means I carry fewer relationships in my circle outside of my kids. I have a handful, but only a few. This realm in Jesus' life is probably what he's best known for. He actually went and specifically chose some friends to be in his circle, and then he did what all good circles do. He gave of himself to make sure that they became something greater. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. Jesus didn't just take whoever happened to be around. He went and got these guys. He saw who they were. He knew where they were now and he called them to come and be something more with him. Guys, I want you to stop letting untested people into this space in your life. I, I want, it's way too important to just take whoever happens to be around. First Corinthians 15 says, do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. I think we can be misled sometimes about the impact that somebody we let this close is actually having on our ability to become more of who God made us to be. So I want you to put them to the test. I have five questions. If you've already got your pen out, you can write these down. Five questions. One, is this a person of character? Two, do we share a vision for something in life? Three, do they show up for me? Four, have they loved me when I'm unlovable? And five, will they tell me the truth? The people in your circle, you need to have yeses to these questions or you will never become all of who God has made you to be. He has a circle for you. If you don't have one today, I want you to start asking God for it because He wants it for you. He wants to craft a circle in your life that can help you become all of who He already knows you will be. Well, the next realm can also help with that. It is community. The next realm of, of relationship is community. Community is your extended network of people, the fabric. I like to call it like a web, an intricately woven web that gives strength, kind of foundational strength underneath your life. When I think about loving people in this realm of community, I think about one simple thing. We can love people in community by showing God's favor. To love people in this realm of relationship is actually a choice. You don't have to do it. This, is, this realm of relationship you can either develop and have or you can leave completely out because you have to receive yourself and come into a community as responsible to a larger group of people. And even doing that is an act of love because you don't have to, you have to choose it but I want you to choose it because I know, I've actually tried this myself, I know that loners rarely feel the kind of support in their life that comes from this realm of relationship. And the one simple way that we can love each other well as a community is to favor each other. I know this sounds crazy. I was writing this down and it even sounded a little wrong to me, but just go with me here. We should be wildly favoring each other. Like when we're in a room, we should prefer each other over other people that are not part of our community. And I know that sounds wacky, but it's absolutely true. John 13, 35 says, by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. If you love one another, Guys, we are supposed to be as a community known for the strong preference of goodness and love and favor that we show to each other 
only and simply because we are connected in this community. If you are watching this right now, then you can be part of this community and we can show each other the kind of favor and preference that only people in the same community get. And I'm not kidding. I actually had someone show up to my house one time to measure my windows for some new blinds. We had moved into the house that we're living in now. This was um, years ago, actually, before my face was as recognizable as it is now. And I, um, I let him in and we're ch chatting and we discovered we both go to Crossroads. And he goes, oh, well, you get the friends and family discount then. And I, um, I was like, wait, what? You're gonna give me a discount on my blinds? He was like, absolutely. He goes, we're family. And he meant it, we're family. I also have recently encountered kind of the power of this community connection in an unexpected place. My oldest son plays basketball a lot. He has a new AAU team that he was just a part of this last year. And they travel around and do all kinds of stuff together. But we didn't know anyone on the team, so we're at the first game. And um, a set of the parents came up and introduced themselves to me because they recognized me from our community here at Crossroads. And one quick conversation told me immediately that we had kind of a, I don't know, like a kinship, like a connection that was uncommon only because we're both a part of this community. So another game or two down the line, and I realized not just that, we actually share some other things as well. We share similar um, values on parenting, on money, on character development, on how we deal with God in our home and our family, and just from sitting on the bench at a basketball game. We're uncovering these connections. In another month, we're driving our kids back and forth to out of town tournaments and actually staying at the houses of like my in-laws, our extended family for no other reason than just to favor each other, just because we wanted to be good to each other, just because we wanted to help each other's family to live better. Friends, this is God at work. This is God weaving community into my life, and I want that for you. This realm of community was very obvious in the life of Jesus there was a larger group of disciples actually that he lived around. Sometimes as you read about his life, they're referred to as the 72. There was clearly a larger group of some sort that traveled occasionally or was coached and instructed and loved occasionally by Jesus. And we find him with them a lot. And he showed some of them a very special preference. There were three that were siblings, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. We don't find their names in his 12, but in John 11, it says this. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. So the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Well, Lazarus actually died before Jesus arrived, but he showed up and he gave them great favor. He actually raised Lazarus from the dead. He loved these guys. They weren't in his 12, but he had connection. Maybe they were part of the 72, maybe they were part of his larger community, but he loved them and he showed them favor. And it was because they were both following the same God. They were both focused on the kingdom. Now the line that you draw between your 12 and your community can be a little bit painful, I think. But you have to draw it, because remember, we're limited. And we do relate to community a little bit differently than our 12, but we can still prefer each other. We can still favor each other. We can still be good to each other anytime and every time that we find ourselves together. I think one of the, uh, most of the time we overlook the power in this realm altogether until something goes wrong, right? Um, I think a lot of us have discovered the power of relationship in this realm through a move, a divorce, an illness, or whatever. I certainly did. A couple years back, I um, actually fell down a huge um, wooden set of stairs and broke my ribs and I couldn't drive, I couldn't lift anything, I couldn't bend over, I couldn't sleep flat. I felt so loved. 
like overwhelmingly loved through weird support pillows. Some a friend left my favorite blow pop flavor on my front porch. We got food, we had prayers. I had people driving my kids around for like two and a half months. I was totally overwhelmed. And it made me want to be that for other people in my community. And my friends, my neighbors who saw this happening, they actually found it super attractive. And that's exactly what Jesus meant when He said it's by our love for each other that we'll be known as His disciples. We got to stop treating this realm as nice to have, guys. It is essential to your stability mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and you will be missing out on so much if you never pursue this. And probably some hugs and maybe a couple free drinks along the way as well. But seriously, there's a major, major source of love and power in here for you. Now remember, as you're writing in your notebook, none of these are static. Now, you can't get too close, because I wrote down a bunch of names here of my own, and I drew, actually drew some arrows, because some people are on the move. They're either moving in or moving out. Some people I have questions about, they're sitting maybe right on the line between two. And um, others, I can see movement over time and they've landed in a different spot. So um, these are by no means static. And as a matter of fact, sometimes they're phases. But the question for us today is, what is God doing right now? What's the trajectory of your relationships that you're thinking about? What realm do you not have maybe that you need to develop and who should be a little closer or maybe a little further away? We're gonna get back to Allie in just a minute. But first, I wanna talk about generosity. It's one of the hallmarks of this community called Crossroads. Now, I know that a church talking about generosity can feel self-serving, so we've actually designed a way for you to try giving risk-free. It's called the 90-day tithe test, and it works like this. You try giving for 90 days, and if you don't feel and sense God more in your life, we'll give all of your money back. If you wanna do that, you can go to crossroads.net slash tithe test. Now, let's get back to Allie. So let's go right back into the very last realm of relationship. This one is the furthest out. It's called the crowd. And I'm not talking about like Disney on spring break kind of crowds. I'm talking about the others the people that don't fit the definitions of any of the three that we have already explored, but they're in your life, right? There's a lot more people in your life than are in your core, your circle, or even your community. Maybe they're kind of permanently the guy that sits down the cubicle from you, or you know they kind of come in and out of your life in a season, and you can sort of take them or leave them, right? I mean, the impact on our hearts here is usually pretty small, and it almost goes without saying, but I'll say it anyway, we don't entrust our hearts to people in our crowd. We don't treat the crowd as though they're our core. We don't give them our well-being. I like to say that we're authentic, but we're not transparent. The crowd doesn't deserve all of you. And you certainly don't need to be unendingly available to the crowds. I always talk about this realm with my teenagers a lot because it's a very hard concept in middle school and high school to convince your teenagers that you don't have to be wrapped up emotionally with all the people, you really don't. It's so helpful to have the language of crowd to give my kids the freedom to decide that some people can just be left in our friendly crowd. Friendly, it's not bad. The crowds are not bad. We can just interact with grace we can not give big emotional attachments and we can move on with our day. The defining feature of your crowd is that you make no like proactive investments. Now, when I say proactive, I don't mean that we don't make investments and I don't mean that crowds are meaningless. They are certainly not in our life. But in our crowd, we wait, we watch, and we follow God's lead. What we want is to see what God is up to with all these other people in our life. And when we see it, then we invest. We love people in our crowd well when we invite, when we stay invitational, when we are open because God is invitational and open. That's how He loves all people. And God wants to invite all people closer to Him. And many times He's gonna do that through a timely interaction in the crowd. Maybe 
you're in someone's crowd and that's how God's gonna bring you closer or maybe someone comes into your crowd and something happens. How do we see that in the life of Jesus? Well, I see that Jesus was in and out of crowds all the time, but he never chased one, never. He stayed completely authentic to the message and the mission that his father sent him on. He stayed totally connected and committed to his disciples and his community, but he was always watching. Jesus went through crowds all the time, watching, waiting to see who was ready to step out of the crowd for something more. We see this in Matthew 20, when it says, as Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside and when they heard Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the louder, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? He asked, Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately, they received their sight and followed him. These guys were part of the crowd and they stepped out of the crowd and Jesus stopped and noticed. It says he had compassion on them. And did you notice how it ended that they actually followed him? Maybe they became part of his community. Maybe they were coming a step closer from that point on when we're open and watching, then God can direct anything to happen. He can originate some of the coolest new opportunities you might ever have to either give or receive some of His love, some of His truth, some of His grace. Crowds can be amazing. But Jesus also knew when it was time to walk away. He knew that crowds would take as much as He gave, and He also knew that crowds would never fill Him back up. So you find often through the Gospels that he would withdraw from them to be alone with his father or maybe even with just his core. And the crowds for many of us that I think need to kind of be put back in their place in our life is the ones that we find online, specifically in our social media worlds. Your social media platforms are crowds, you all. They are crowds. I want you to stop treating social media followers like they're all your actual friends. I think sometimes we tend to give them the emotion and the transparency that frankly should be reserved for our core. And the expectation of support we have to uh, online is maybe that, that we need to have that expectation of our circle. And sometimes the pain of treating all of our followers on social media as though they're real community, boy, it is painful. We have to stop expecting that kind of stuff from a crowd and start instead putting some limits on your time there. Jesus always engaged the crowds. He delivered the message that God gave him. So go, be yourself, speak the truth, be grace, be light in the world, and also keep your eyes open for interesting things that God might do there. But friends, you gotta walk away, like on the regular. I would recommend a limit per day or a day off per week, just something where you are, where you are teaching yourself, I've got to walk away because at the end of the day, the crowds are just the crowds. I'm willing to guess that a lot of the pain that we all experience and that you're experiencing maybe right now in your relational world is from one of a couple places. Either you have people in the wrong realm of relationship, like somebody who's out here um, we're treating like somebody who's a lot closer and you know, we get burned a little bit or maybe we just haven't realized there's any lines at all. Just been unwilling to define who's in and who's out of any realm. Or maybe you have a blank circle. If you have a blank circle, I would encourage you to start praying, start asking God to develop that realm in your life. If you think that your circle is 25 people right now, then you should ask God which handful are really your circle. If you have a blank place in community, I want you to invest yourself in this community. You're gonna find so much here for you. When you get clear about who fits where in your life, then you can actually start to love everybody better. Nobody is in your life by accident. Nobody. 
and every single person you know actually deserves your love, but they don't all need it the same way. Every single person you know is someone that Jesus came to die for, who He loves an incredible amount, and you are invited in all the unique ways in every realm of relationship to help Him love them. So when you know who's in your core, your circle, your community, and your crowd, then you know exactly what that looks like. I'm gonna pray for us, for you and for me, to have the wisdom that Jesus had to build your relational world like His so that all your relationships can thrive. Father, um, I thank you for all the people in my life. I pray that you would continue to refine and define who's in and who's out of my relational life. I wanna love people like you did, Lord. And um, I just pray for the wisdom for me and for others to um, do that really, really well. Pray that you would give every person listening the courage to make any change that you are pushing them to make. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, hey, sometimes relationships can be overwhelming in our life, but I'm telling you, anything is possible. And I want you to tell God with me that right now. Hi, my name is Robbie, and I'm one of the folks that gets to do music here at Crossroads. I don't know about you, but I find in any given day, there are so many voices vying for my attention. I mean, gosh, social media alone, there's Instagram posts, there's conversations on Facebook, there's the news. I listen to NPR on the way in to, to work, and I, I get calls from people who are concerned about different things, and I get mail coming in, and I've got my kids and my kids' teachers and what's going on with work and all the things. And in, in, in the day, it just gets so loud. To think that God could break through the noise is just nearly impossible unless we take time to deliberately quiet the voices. And that's just what we're gonna do right now so that we can hear what the Lord would speak. We're gonna just take a moment to, to push down all the conversations that are happening in social media, push down all the conversations that are going on um, in our family and in complicated relationships, just to hear what would God say to us in this moment? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let's just quiet those voices now. Let us take the time and silence all the noise. Calm our racing minds And listen for His voice For the God of all creation Is with us in this place We don't have to leave the same For anything is possible when Jesus is here. His kingdom is unstoppable. His love draws us near. And lift your hands and surrender. When Jesus is here And full of grace and life There is healing in His hands And 
living waters arise to a dry and thirsty land, and He is worthy of devotion and never-ending praise, and we don't have to. Jesus is here His kingdom is unstoppable His love draws us near Lift your hands and surrender But Jesus is here When we worship walls start shaking In your presence chains are breaking for anything is possible Jesus, when we call your name and As we sing in this moment Let us see the heavens open Anything is possible His King is unstoppable His love draws us near So lift your hands and surrender Jesus is here And anything is possible When Jesus is here Hey, if you resonated with today's message on relationships, we have an entire playlist on more about relationships right here. Also, this channel exists to equip and guide you in the adventurous life that God made you for. We have fresh videos every week. Make sure you hit the subscribe button so you don't miss any of them. We'll see you next time.